Hey everybody, David Johnston. I serve as the chairman for Factum. Been involved in the space since 2012 and just amazingly excited to see all the energy in the room. It really reminds me of those early days in 2013 where we celebrate adoption and real usage of the ecosystem. So happy to be here. Hi, I'm Andrew Stone. I'm the lead developer of Bitcoin Unlimited, and I uh, recently proposed the op group tokenization scheme. So, you know, if you want an unbiased opinion on tokenization, I'll, I'll handle all those questions, <laughs> and other people can talk about other stuff. Hi, uh, my name is Emil Oldenburg. I'm the CTO of Bitcoin.com. I've been in Bitcoin since uh, 2013, and... Uh, well, at Bitcoin.com, we our goal is to make Bitcoin Cash the most useful and usable and used uh, currency out there. So, and we see that any anything that makes Bitcoin Cash more use, used is good. Woo. Hi, I'm uh, Justin Bonds, uh, founder of uh, Cyber Capital. We're a uh, cryptocurrency investment fund. So we do a lot of research just, uh, just trying to understand um, cryptocurrency. I'm also a proud uh, early voting member of Bitcoin Unlimited. Uh, some of you might know me as, uh, thank you. Some of you might know me by my alias, uh, Vrita Sapire, where a few years ago I was in the uh, trenches as well, you know, fighting the good fight. So yeah, thank you. Okay, so um, I'm just going to jump in right now and say, all right, what is the state of colored coins today? Your views, gentlemen. On Bitcoin Cash, non-existent. There you go. Um, I'll speak to what I think it can be. Um, what really got me excited originally about the blockchain in general was permissionless innovation. And I think re-embracing the idea of innovation without permission um, is really what makes a protocol useful because it allows people to invent, to experiment, to add value in different ways that we didn't even think about or expect before. Um, and so I think this will be an interesting thing to explore this year as people sort of push the bounds of the opcodes and the things that are being reactivated. So it'll be exciting to see where it goes. Um, I would say that we have the ability to turn on colored coins or colored outputs very soon. The code is ready. There is a pro the, the product is already done. Uh, we just need to agree on how to activate it. Um, I would, I'm going to be a bit controversial here and say uh, I think colored coins work very well over Ethereum today. <laughs> and I would love to see the same thing happen on uh, Bitcoin Cash. And actually the, the idea that you presented earlier regarding um, native colored coins, I actually think that, that would be one of the best ways to go. I'll also just uh, put out there that I think the more utility that a blockchain has, um, I would say the better, you know, as long as we can handle it. Because with more utility comes more value, comes more security, and then more utility again. So that's the virtuous cycle we should be aiming for. Quick question. Now, and thank you, gentlemen, for that. Uh, I was talking with uh, Bram Cohen, um, currently of Chia, and he said, you know, um, today the only reason why uh, Ethereum has value is because of Solidity allowing people to create tokens in Ethereum. You take away tokens, you know, Ethereum has no value. Um, you've proposed um, on the Bitcoin Limited side this new op group, you know, op code. Is that the solution? Is this new op code going to make Bitcoin Cash as easy to create digital assets as it is on Ethereum? I would say that it's a lot easier. Right? So, um, you know, I have a tokenization solution, not a smart contract solution. And the reason why is I came to that same conclusion, which is that... Um, Smart contracts are perhaps awesome in the future, but it's like a huge hammer to create tokens. And so instead of doing something that complex, uh, I opted for a very, and also you, you saw the Ethereum bugs and things, right? So I opted for a, a much simpler solution that I think cat, uh, grabs the majority of today's use cases. And of course, um, what I'm hoping with the Bitcoin Cash scripting language is that it grows in complexity. And if we're doing native, tokens, then as it grows in complexity, your smart contract options will just naturally grow. Got it. Um, 
Yeah, so I think uh, it, was, it was the other week that it was a news article that tens of thousands of Ethereum smart contracts are vulnerable. And uh, that is a very good reason to do a native color, to do a minimum viable token on Bitcoin Cash because we get, we, we, without the complexity, we get the, the functionality. And that's what most people, they just want functionality. Like if Amazon is to issue gift cards uh, on a blockchain, any blockchain, the, for, for Amazon, for example, it will, be, it will make more sense to do a, a simple token on Bitcoin Cash instead of using a very complex solidity, solidity um, program on Ethereum. I think um, a fairly uh, automated, um, you know, standardized process exists now just, just to create a token over Ethereum. Um, uh, so if, if we can create things like DAOs with, with, with more limited, you know, based on a more limited scripting language, um, I would be all for that actually, but I'm, but I'm not sure if, if that would be as efficient in terms of how uh, something like Ethereum can do that today. Actually, maybe that's a question uh, for you. Um. Right, so the DAO has a bunch of rules that are kind of like, um, you know, tally up all the owners' votes to choose what to subsequently vote on, right? Well, I wasn't specifically referring to the DAO, but more the generalized concepts oh. of DAOs, let's say. Uh, yeah. So, yeah. Um, I, I actually question the viability of that whole concept. Um, and th the reason why is fundamentally often people collect money because they want to use it, right? So let's say I want to create like a, a mortgage smart contract, right? So I code in my smart contract, okay, so once a month I'm gonna pay, let's say I create a thousand tokens, once a month in the smart contract I'm gonna pay out, you know, the interest to all the individuals. Now this sounds really nice when you're sitting up here, but then you realize where does the money come from that I use to pay out to those individuals? If I had that money when I made the smart contract, I wouldn't need to have the mortgage in the first place, right? So in order to defeat that smart contract, all I have to do is not pay into it on a monthly basis, right? So that smart contract doesn't actually enforce anything. And so you're basically, you might as well just um, run a little script on your computer, you know, off blockchain that just looks at all the uh, owners of the contract on a particular date and pays them the interest. I think maybe a counter example to that is, uh, I'm rather fond of the idea of being able to create, you know, uh, you know, uh, more decentralized type companies, right? Where if a company makes profit, then part of that profit would go to dividends, would, would go to token holders. And, you know, you combine that with uh, governance as well. As a token holder, you have some degree of governance, like a, like a similar to how a board of directors would work in, in legacy systems. I really do see, uh, you know, efficiencies there, and um, it's 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 easier, and, and, and there's less middlemen, and, and I see advantages there. I mean, as long as we can do it, you know, I'm, I'm more pragmatic like that. If it works, it works, and that seems like something that's that's useful, you know, in, in that sense. No, quick question. Hold on. Yeah. Now, Ethereum has a culture of, you know, oh, yeah, I know you get <laughs> No, Ethereum has a culture of uh, write code fast, break it, you know, just go for it. Um, is the Bitcoin Cash culture about, you know, um, writing new opcodes fast, like, you know, op group, and then letting people break it? Is that, is that culture here? Also, is the culture of trying to raise money an ICOing part of the Bitcoin Cash culture that once the opcode is in, people are just going to rush? I mean, what's, what's driving this, this boat here? So... Um the day after the, uh, the Bitcoin Cash fork, I wrote uh, a document proposing Op Data Sig Verify. Mm -hmm. And about a month after that, I proposed Op Group. And the reason why is because I was looking for ways to drive end user adoption of Bitcoin Cash. Because I felt like we created a lot of capacity, but um, you know we gave away uh, the network effect to Bitcoin. And so we needed to... Um, create compelling reasons, even though payments is going to be, um, uh, you know, the, the most valuable thing in Bitcoin Cash, uh, we need to create secondary uses to get people to install wallets. And uh, so basically what Op Group does is it enhances Bitcoin from a payments network to an exchange network. And I think that's incredibly powerful.
David, you've uh, you know been an investor in you know a lot of. I mean, you've been at the beginning of a lot of digital assets. We met at Mastercoin. You gave me my first job in crypto. Thank you, thank you. Um, <clears throat> that was good. that was a good paying job. Um, but you know, you've seen the evolution um, from you know all the way back 2013 to today. Um, you know, what does Bitcoin Cash need to do to become the most attractive substitute for digitizing and tokenization of real world assets? Well, I think Andrew's point on, which is you can't just create a payment network, you have to allow people to make use cases for that payment network. And so... Um, so we want crypto kitties yeah, on Bitcoin Cash. Absolutely. Bring digital assets. Yeah, why not? Okay. People love kittens. The internet, <laughs> the internet was built on kittens. Well, why not? That's not a bad thing. Right. That was only perceived as a bad thing because it filled up the available capacity of that network. And then it was slow and fees went up and people complained. But if you have the capacity, if you build the space for these use cases, Bring it on, bring right. all those use cases in. And so I think that's a powerful thing where we can be a community that embraces mm -hmm. those use cases. We don't have to fear people using the network. That should never enter our lexicon. Let's expand the capacity. The answer is when it gets full, let's expand the capacity. I don't think that's a problem. That's actually a feature, like bring it on. So when is it gonna happen, guys? I mean, I'm ready to go. When is it gonna happen? Come on. I love it. Uh, well, as I said earlier, we need to uh, come together as a community and decide on when to activate it. And that has been some, some contention. Uh, it has been a very good debate. Oh, it is a fight. Talk to me. What's yeah, happening? but it's been a very good debate, an open debate on Reddit that was not censored. Because if this was our Bitcoin, and <laughs> <laughs> it would have been censored. That's right. <laughs> like, if you don't agree with the party line... You're done. You're out. You're kicked out. And that is not the case in the Bitcoin Cash community. We can have a very lively, open debate, and that's good. Okay. And uh, another thing, if we were to have uh, CryptoKitties on, uh, on Bitcoin Cash, I would probably, you can, you can do it. You don't, there's a lot of functionality there in, this, in the smart contract on uh, Ethereum that you cannot really do uh, in, with the scripting language. In Bitcoin Cash, so what you would, so the easiest way of doing it would probably be to like, you you buy a ten dollar per month VPS on DigitalOcean, and you just fire up a, a Bitcoin J SPV wallet, and you just have this wallet perform all the different CryptoKitty things, right? And that will be very cheap to run. It will be require very little resources, and that's why we need we want native tokens. Well, I think that's an important point because there's a world of things that you can do outside of the blockchain and run those programs. And when it comes to actual payment and transfer of value and moving around the token, that's where it's important that you have a connection to the ledger. There's a world of programs that need to run. And then what we can do is store persistently those outcomes from the program in the blockchain and really use that as the transfer and exchange mechanism that you're talking about. Yeah, so as I was trying to say with smart contracts, really, if your smart contract is not 100% trustless, including funding that contract, then you might as well run it off chain, right? Or you can run it off chain because you're, you're trusting that the contract gets funded. So you're not a fan of the VM is what you're saying? I think that um, we're still looking for an awesome use case for uh, smart contracts, and I hope that one appears and revolutionizes the world. But in the meanwhile, we have you know every stock, bond, mortgage, uh, uh, land, oh, title, right, that could be put onto uh, the blockchain with tokens and um, an indication of you know like a. Uh, English or a uh, natural language document, you know, saying how this uh, token is enforced. Yeah, I, I have to agree with Andrew here actually that uh, for an application, if you're able to do it on the blockchain, I would argue that's better actually because uh, doing things on chain gives you a much better trust model. And, and for many applications, I think this is um, very important. So, uh, 
And we have to also keep in mind, you know, as the Bitcoin Cash community, that when we're competing with systems that can do it on-chain, then, you know, maybe we should cross that road as well and, um, you know, um, give them a good fight. Okay. New idea. A lot of new stuff is launching um, outside of the Ethereum Bitcoin ecosystem um, that is attempting to work on what we call cross-atomic contract swaps. So if I have tokens in Ethereum, I can swap them for tokens in Cosmos or you know, something else in Bitcoin Cash. Is there some interest in interacting with other chains um, in these swap-type crazy locking stuff that we're here going on? And what are your thoughts? So I actually think that's very interesting. Um, and I'm sort of previewing the talk that I'm going to give tomorrow. Um, but basically, you know, in um, the uh, colored coin to Bitcoin Cash, there's two main sort of possibilities. One is to put the information in a meta chain in op return, and the other one is a native token in op, um, using op group. Right. And the problem with um, an op return is that. Uh, anyone can sort of put any data they want in the off return, right? So it means that the miners don't validate the information. You can just forge a whole bunch of fake uh, transactions and the client has to decide what's true or not. And the end result of that is that you need a, um, you need a full node to discover this, right? right? So, okay. So that is a big liability with that architecture. And what's actually, this now to come full with your question, is it, so it turns out from, it basically means you can't run an SPV wallet, right? right? But let's say I had two separate SPV um, capable blockchains and they were able, and your wallet could easily move between their tokens using these atomic cross-chain transactions. And it's actually more efficient to run two separate blockchains, both doing, uh, you know, one being, say, Bitcoin Cash, the other one being native tokens. Right. So I, I would say that that architecture is actually... Um, from a, from a wallet, you know, from a technical standpoint, a better architecture than using meta coins in op return. Got it. Um, another thing about uh, putting uh, metadata in the op return is that the node, the client, needs to verify, it, it's basically client validation. So the client, the, the receiver, needs to decide if it's valid or not. So in case of a hard fork, you don't have proof of work that decides the victor. So the, uh, the, the really interesting thing with proof of work is that when you have a disagreement, uh, you decide the victor by proof of work. That's basically what happens when you have an orphan, for example. Uh, a victor is decided by proof of work. I mean, personally, I think we're gonna have both uh, solutions. You know, it's exciting to see this interoperability, which we've been talking about for a long time, between the different uh, chains becoming a reality. Um, and to your point, I think it helps to have specialization in different chains, and you have proof of work from each chain to validate that. Um, but I think there are use cases where it makes sense to have client interpretation. So I think it depends on whether it's something at the protocol level, something infrastructural level, or whether it's uh, an application that's running on top of one of those protocols. Yeah. So I think um, interoperability is very interesting and actually has some very interesting consequences as well. One of the consequences is actually that the uh, net network effect of money, as we traditionally know it, has actually been, I would argue, significantly weakened. Because I think the way I see this playing out is if you go to a store and they only accept Litecoin and you have uh, Peercoin, just some randomly bad examples actually, but uh, that, that you should just be able to seamlessly uh, transact and that, that that's not something you have to think about. However, there is another very strong network effect, which, which I think the strongest network effect is actually security when it, when it comes to these blockchains, when really assessing their um, usefulness, their, their utility. So for that reason, I think there can only be so many uh, dominant protocol layers. And this is why I would also argue against specialization, that if we can build a blockchain that can do all of these things, then this is a blockchain that has the highest network effect and therefore so the highest security. And, and I think that's, that's something that's worth striving for. You know, if possible, of course, we have to be pragmatic and we're yet to see what all the technologists are gonna come up with here. It leads me to another question talking about security. So, you know, my wife and I have an agreement that she'll monitor my uh, Ethereum wallet, you know, as a safety precaution. And 
I was just testing some spank chain tokens the other day, you know, for science. Um, so because I have no real privacy on Ethereum, every one of my token transactions are trackable. Um, privacy is now being a big discussion, you know, um, on Ethereum. Uh, it's a discussion in Zcash and others. Um, where does Bitcoin Cash stand with regards to tokens and privacy, being able to enhance that given that we don't even get that out of Bitcoin Core? Well, I think this ties in with the previous subject. If you're interpreting things at the application layer, you can keep a lot of private data private and simply publish audit trails and proofs to the main chain that don't expose anything about the private information that you're using at the application layer. I think that's actually important for how we do privacy. I do want to see on-chain privacy okay. move forward, but in the meantime, while a lot of those things are being tested, I think the shortcut immediately, and, and what we see today, is you can bring that to the application layer and just be publishing these proofs. Well, hold on a minute. Even if we're publishing proofs, I still am signing transactions on chain. People are still seeing my tokens move on chain. They can still, they may not know what the token is for, but they can still see that the token transaction moved between my wallet address and another wallet address. Is there no way for me to obfuscate or make private those transactions? Well, there is. I mean, you could simply use a mixer if you break the links. Which um, kind of mixer I'm going to use here? I mean, all mixers have shown to have some sort of failure, right? Um, so it's a bit hit or miss, especially now. Um, some Hold mixers on, we work. We don't have a privacy. We have no privacy answer. Nothing in the pipeline to say, hey, privacy and tokens on Bitcoin Cash are going to be better. I think there definitely are solutions, but I think privacy is actually one of the issues currently that is contentious, okay. even within Bitcoin Cash. And I think there's a this is one of these few issues in that arguments can be made to not have on-chain uh, privacy features. And good arguments can also be made that we should have on-chain privacy right. features. So this is actually uh, a sticky subject, and it's going to be interesting to see how this evolves into the future. Um, I have to say, I, I've mixed feelings about it because because I do see the advantages of having a completely transparent chain, but that that would actually um, counteract what I said earlier about specialization. Uh, you know, maybe optional privacy for that reason would be uh, would be a better way to go. And there definitely are technological solutions. The question is, are, do we want to implement these solutions um, you know, on the protocol level in Bitcoin Cash? And I'd also say mixers do work if, if you have a good mixer and, you know, right. it's, 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 it's always a tricky subject. But. Andrew? So, uh, th but this is the sort of thing, if you use native tokens and we fix privacy for Bitcoin Cash, then we're going to fix it for the tokens automatically. Um, in the very long term, I think uh, a new encryption format like BLS encryption is really interesting. Woo! Yeah, but that's very long, right? That's a very long term. Long term? Uh, a couple of years, maybe. Oh, that sounds like a block stream. Anyway, sorry. I did exchange right. some emails with one of the authors, <laughs> and uh, he was super months. excited. Uh, and is using it in a, you know, his, he's using his own work in a, right. in a proprietary right. blockchain. Right, so right, right. BLS encryption is happening in blockchains. BLS is happening, and yeah. aggregate signatures are hot. Um, definitely something to look at. Um, okay, so, you know, um, coming back now to, you know, being ready for bringing tokens, you know, um, into the Bitcoin Cash ecosystem, just coming away from the tech and now talking maybe about the community. You know, what other activities are going on in the community that people can become aware of tokenization, the tokenization roadmap for Bitcoin Cash? Um, if they're not, you know, sort of focused on the engineering, what signals can they look for? Well, currently I see that the community is uh, very focused on adoption and utility, making Bitcoin Cash uh, more usable. And uh, by bringing tokens to it, uh, I, th I see that's, that's just along the, the, the uh, that's what we're already doing. Like we're just adding, adding tokens would, all, would just increase the utility okay. and uh, adoption. So since I'm traveling, I spent the whole morning like hating my ebook system and thinking about how you know if you tokenized your ownership of an ebook, then you could actually um, transfer that ownership, right? right. Um, and there's there's a bunch of um, 
potential issues with this half-baked idea. One is I just give everyone my private key, right? And then, and then they can all use my book. But there's a solution to that, and then I'll just stop there, which is uh, maybe the publisher forces a person to put down a deposit in, you know, Bitcoin Cash, like, you know, $10 on that same private key. So then if I give that private key that can, you know, unlock the book to a stranger, he can steal the deposit, right? right? So I think there might be some solutions there, and it would, you know, drive the blockchain onto uh, every e-reader. And at the same time, I think it would, you know, help our, more of our philosophy of, you know, um, sort of... Um, end users' rights, which has been undermined by, you know, the book industry, right? Fair use exists on hardcover books, but not on e-books, right? One thing I'd love to uh, see come back is discounts for pain in Bitcoin Cash. Yep. I mean, for e-commerce folks, the payment in Bitcoin Cash is a huge advantage because they have no risk of chargeback or fraud, mm -hmm. right? And so this saves some percentage of the revenue of uh, major uh, e-commerce retailers. And so, you know, for a while there's a movement in the Bitcoin space before fees got high to really offer discounts for payment. And I think that's a cool user uh, incentive that crosses all use cases. Right. Everybody wants to get paid to use a more efficient system of money. And so I think that'll be interesting to see if that comes back and we're starting to see some of those people offer discounts. Uh, on top of that, in terms of uh, offering discounts for Bitcoin Cash, it's also the user that pays the fee and not the merchant. So actually, Bitcoin uh, flips that model around in a, what I would think a very positive way, actually. So I, I definitely agree with you there. Especially when the fee is under a penny. Exactly. <laughs> Especially then. Um, you know, when we look at um, Opgroup as a new innovation um, you know, for essentially native tokenization, um, and we still have the option of doing, you know, either bare multi-sig or op return. Um, do you foresee that people are going to start using these different colored coin approaches in Bitcoin Cash? Or folks will, you know, essentially op group is so attractive for native activity, most folks are just going to go for the, op, the native option. So um, I got all excited about colored coins in 2012, yep. right? But a wallet... It took forever for a wallet to appear because of the complexities and you know, a light wallet never appeared. Right. So that's why when I designed OpGroup, my number one criteria was SPV wallet capable. So I do think that it will take over these other use cases because I felt like we would have had colored coins you know, four years ago if, it, if they were SPV wallet capable. One thing that is very uh, good to keep in mind for the for the native colored coins, which is the the op group, uh, is that every wallet can support it. Uh, it's SPV compatible, but as I said earlier in my in my talk, um, is also every wallet has to support it. There is mandatory. Uh, they have to support it some way or the other because. If a wallet is not upgraded and it tries to spend the colored coins in an invalid way, uh, the wallet will keep signing a transaction that is not valid, that will never be received by, by the network, and the wallet will not understand why the transaction gets rejected. Um, so because of this property, um, every wallet will implement it. And uh, all the hardware wallets, every single SPV wallet, bread wallet, like if you have an... Um, a token that is using op return, for example, you cannot receive that token on your bread wallet because it's an SPV wallet. Uh, only the hosted wallets like uh, Bitcoin.com and Copay would be able to support uh, all the different op return tokens. Awesome, quick question for you. I'm gonna jump in here um, because you know I was inspired to think of another sort of barrier to adoption, which is essentially confirmation time, all right? Um, you know, we have to wait 10 minutes for a block. Um, you know, in Ethereum, they're, what, 15 seconds? Um, you know, so my question is, you know, do we still have a problem of speed that even if we got the token hotness, um, you know, Bitcoin Cash will still be competing against other chains that, you know, allow people to essentially run and process transactions faster? Is that a concern? Uh, I would say... Um, it it's not really 10 minutes since Bitcoin Cash 
is so safe for zero confirmation, it is less than a second. <laughs> it's a few milliseconds. Tom, we're where's Tom? What <laughs> <laughs> um, one thing that is good to keep in mind for tokens that, if, for example, if a an ICO is going to pay out dividend to uh, shareholders, they probably not going to pay out dividend to uh, share to people that hold to unconfirmed tokens. They're only going to pay out to confirmed tokens. So in the token case, it would most likely be, you will probably have to wait 10 minutes at least to, to be a confirmed holder of this token. One important thing to understand is um, since anyone can throw unvalidated data in op return, um, you could double spend that very easily. In fact, um, you couldn't even, like miners couldn't even detect the double spend because I'm just create. I would create arbitrary transactions and I, even I couldn't control which, uh, the, the, the first one that was, that made it in the block, right, the, the you know, closest to the coin base would be the one that uh, was considered valid even if there would be multiples in the block. Whereas uh, with the um, op group, you could, rely on zero conf just as much as you do today with Bitcoin Cash. I'm gonna predictably have, a, have another unpopular opinion here. Um, but, but first of all, I'll say um, uh, zero confirmation, I think works very well. And, and as Thomas actually also uh, mentioned, um, with, a, with a, a payment processor, it, it, it's very reliable. Um, and and w uh, there's w we're now thinking of ways to do this without payment processors more reliably, which I think is very interesting. But I, but I do think that you know, if we, I think we can have shorter block times. Woo! And I think that would be a good thing because there's certain situations like, you know, I might receive a token and I might want to send that token. And uh, if I have to wait 10 minutes to be able to send that token again, and that can be a lot longer as well because of variance, that, that could be up to an hour. So, so if you say have a, I was throwing a number out there, a, a two and a half minute block time. Stop. Right? <laughs> Crazy, right? Crazy, Crazy. right? Crazy, oh yeah, right. God. Right, but in that case, the actual max variance is, is significantly lower. And I just, it would just be a better user experience and, you know, more useful. And, and I know to some people, um, you know, 10 minute confirmation times are somehow sacrosanct and the perfect number. But... Um, I, I don't see anything wrong with, uh, with reducing block times, actually. I, yeah. I think that would be a good thing. I, I think that's beneficial also in the fact that you increase capacity. Because if we're at 32 megabytes mm. per block, yeah. and if you're doing blocks at a minute, right. two right. minutes... What's this 32 megabyte per block thing? Uh, it's coming, my friend. It's coming. It's, it's, coming. <laughs> oh, it's already today. today. <laughs> Soon. Soon it's going to be more. It's called but, emergent consensus. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Emergent consensus. But no, I, I really loved the way uh, Gavin Andreessen did it back in the day. He did a lot of testing, and he would just assert, hey, this is what the data says, and I think we're reasonably safe with X amount of time. You know, um, I think 10 minutes originally was fairly conservative, um, and I think there's a lot of room to improve that in the, the next version. So uh, BU actually has, you know, studying that on our roadmap. Um, but to give like a little preview, in even some of our earliest um, studies moving blocks through the GFC, uh, the firewall of China, right, uh, out even to the U.S., we were able to move those blocks in like less than a second, right? And the way we did it was we created redundant paths through the GFC. And right now, I mean, you know, um, if you're using X thin or compact blocks, you're barely, pa you're not passing a megabyte, you're passing one, you know, internet packet, right? And that's much more likely to pass smoothly through the network than have a bunch of retries. So uh, I'm not gonna suggest five second blocks, but actually <laughs> you can move the blocks across the world much faster than people think. So um, I have to say here that um, I've actually lost my train of thought. Sorry about that. I'll pass it on. Um, I'm now just going to mention that it's, per it's perfectly safe to, uh, to keep s uh, spending unconfirmed uh, transactions that you get uh, up to, uh, I don't know the number, was it 25? Yeah, yeah something like that. Uh, so like, if you have a token that is an Amazon gift card, for example, uh, you can treat it as any kind of output when it comes to spending. Uh, and for Amazon, g receiving their gift card as a token is uh, unconfirmed is, is considered very safe. 
Um, so that doesn't really matter. And they can receive a chain of unconfirmed and they will most likely, all of them, be mined in the same block. So the block time is, doesn't really matter. Like when, when, we, when we're talking tokens, the only time where the block time actually matters is for, for shareholders when they're paying out dividends. That's the only time it actually matters. That's a great point, actually, because a, a lot of my unit tests, um, you know, I don't want to wait, so I just create big chains of unconfirmed token moves and then confirm them all in a block, so. I'm, I'm going to have to disagree there a little bit. I've, I, I've, I've experienced a lot where, um, actually, I, I did this the other day, you know, I think we all do a lot of evangelizing here. I, I, I sent some Bitcoin Cash to a new user, and this user wanted to send Bitcoin Cash straight away, and I had to explain to him, no, you can't do that. You have to wait, you know, for a confirmation, and if that confirmation came faster, it would simply be a better user experience. I'm, I'm going to actually remember what I was going to say before, so I'll just touch on that. I think the idea that if we reduce block times, it's not equivalent to increasing the capacity. It doesn't have to be. So if we're already at our theoretical limit, we can still increase, uh, sorry, decrease the uh, block times and simply decrease the block size limits and we still have the same, let's say, 32 megabytes, for example, and I think that's also perfectly legitimate. Yeah. Um, you should probably tell them to install a better wallet that allows them to, to spend <laughs> unconfirmed. <laughs> I know a pretty good wallet. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> All right. Uh, they come. Do we, should we, uh, audience, would you like to ask some questions of our awesome panel? Yeah, definitely. All right. Okay, so um, you're going to forgive us because we're out of mics, um, but I'm going to grab one. Do I got to, oops, I'm, I'm, drip, I'm drooping. Okay, sorry. All right. Wow. Okay, here you go. I'm going to come down to you. What's the difference between colored coins and uh, the uh, counterparty cash? Um, so native colored coins, uh, the op group, is a native colored output on layer one. Uh, it doesn't use op return, while counterparty cash would use the op return uh, data, which requires a full node and cannot be run on an SVB node. It, it's, it's like a blockchain that's running inside arbitrary data inside the Bitcoin Cash blockchain. So for example, in order to, you, you literally have to move Bitcoin Cash into counterparty cash, which they call XCP, and then you can spend that to deal, you know, to move tokens. So uh, guys, uh, our business does online gaming. Um, and we have a lot of use cases, obviously, for colored coins. But one of uh, our main concerns is having, having the owner of the colored coin have to pay for the transaction is a big problem. So is there any future thought given to how a, uh, an organization could actually pay for the transaction cost on behalf of their customer to move the colored coin? He's asking about essentially delegated signing. So, you know. Wouldn't like child pays for parent handle that today? Possibly, yeah. yeah. Um, so you're, you're basically talking about sending a zero fee transaction, correct? Because, uh, yeah, with, with the current, current specification for uh, op group, uh, zero, trans fee, zero fee transactions are not allowed. Um, but that's not specific to op group at all. Um, and allowing that could potentially have some, some side effects. Um, I, I have, someone told me today that they wanted to have the ability to pay the mining fee with the token, um, but th that is not something that is in the current specification. Uh, so um, the idea that we could pay the mining fee with the token, I'm just going to put it out there, that's, we shouldn't do that because <laughs> it actually messes with the uh, value proposition actually and uh, you, know, you want to create demand for the protocol layer token which gives us uh, the security of the system actually. So uh, medium of exchange, sorry. 
Exactly, yeah, and you know, and, and we need that uh, the security that, that that gives essentially. So, so in short, it's it's not directly possible in the way that you're describing it. Uh, I hate saying this actually, but if you centralize and 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 do the token transactions for your customers, that might actually be one way to do it practically. But it's uh, it's not as nice, is it? You you still need to use Bitcoin Cash as rocket fuel to uh, to send a token. And uh, even, even, if, even if you're spreading tokens, uh, so if you are evangelizing tokens and telling everyone like, hey, this is my, my amazing token, they still need to use Bitcoin Cash, which makes them a Bitcoin Cash user. So I think that's probably not, a, a, not a necessarily a bad thing that they need to have Bitcoin Cash as the fuel to, uh, to be able to use the token. Question? Um, the question about the broken interval. Um, so now some wallets like uh, lock the six confirmation to move to other wallet. Um, is it a safeness? I mean, safetyness. It's come from amount of electricity the miner use. So if that's the uh, interval is shorter, like say thirty seconds, is do we still have to wait one hour to get sa same kind of securities? Uh, we actually don't really need to wait six confirmations anymore, and we haven't. We don't. We don't actually. That's just a, an old practice that's been that uh, some exchanges have have kept up with. But we don't need six confirmations anymore. We have. We haven't needed it for years. It's just uh, an old practice. Um, well, I, I think there are some cases where you might want some more confirmations, but that's only when you're dealing with a very high amount of value. So if you look at what the block reward is, and then you look at the size of your transaction, that might be a good way to kind of measure up, you know, the, the ballpark of that. Um, but I was actually corrected before in that, you know, uh, maybe just use a wallet that does allow you to spend unconfirmed outputs because uh, it's it's not part of this restriction is not part of the protocol layer, but specific wallet implementations. Yeah. Question here. Yeah. Hi. So in this native UTXO model, does that is that mean that the colored coins are represented by satoshis? Is that what that is, or is it not? So um, in the original. Um, uh, version of this, I had one Satoshi for one colored coin and there was a direct representation, but I did get a surprising amount of pushback for that, so I actually um, added, uh, so uh, as Emil showed, you, it's, uh, you give the asset tag and then you give a quantity, okay, and, it, uh, and the miner balances that quantity, so you just need to make sure that in terms of Satoshis, you have at least one in the output, otherwise, you know, it's a zero-valued output. Uh, so, so one Satoshi can actually correspond to many units? Yeah, there's no relationship anymore between the number of Satoshi in the output and the number of tokens. Okay, uh, excellent, thank you. And I think that's probably the right way to go because then it's a lot more flexible in the way you're encoding the data versus the one-to-one, -one. so glad to see that. That's good, um, and I'm glad to get that validation. The one thing that concerns me a little bit is everyone's thinking of these tokens as representing, um, you know, something. Whereas I originally called this op group too because I thought there might be reasons to group uh, Bitcoin Cash, right? And so I gave away that feature um, in order to have this because now you can move your satoshis in and out of the the group outputs. So hopefully no one will find a compelling use for <laughs> it as a group of Bitcoin Cash Satoshis. Um, so in the, um, in the Color Coins talk, uh, you talk about two different possible implementations. There was uh, one uh, about using off group, and the other one was about changing the transaction format, right? Um, so can you, can you talk more about what's the, what are the benefits of using off group instead of changing the transaction format with a uh, f with a hard fork, uh, especially is a, will, would there be um, benefits uh, programmatically for the day if we get there to the, the day we have uh, smart contracts? Um, so for your first question, uh, the changing the whole transaction format is something that people have, been pro have proposed and keep proposing once in a while, uh, but is an enormous change. It will take years 
to uh, to to go through with that. And even and it's it's something that and the thing is like I don't think we we really want to change the whole transaction format only to act to get tokens. Uh, we probably want to make sure that we get a lot of new functionality with that. Um, but there's there's other other problems because it's, it will be a very long process. It will be a lot of different opinions on how to do it the right way and. Yes, by using uh, op group, it, the op group is simply the most pragmatical approach and the most reasonable approach. Uh, I think uh, Andrew has some. <laughs> uh, Andrew can probably tell more about why you should not add new features when you completely change the architecture. So I will say in a second, but I do want to make a stronger statement, uh, which is that semantically it's exactly the same, and ironically, if you just you just added an asset tag below the, the value, and you look at the serialized format of that transaction versus op group, the data lies out in, in the serialized format exactly the same, right? So it's just the humans who decided, oh, I'm gonna take this piece of data and you know, uh, assign it a special you know, variable name, right? So that's a huge amount of work just to, you know, uh, and I agree that it's good to have nice, clean code and everything, but it's a tremendous, like, we're talking, year, you know, potentially, as Emil was saying, years of work just to, like, make people f have, like, a slightly warmer and fuzzier feeling about, you know, their code, right? Um, and also, yeah, so in terms of, you know, developing uh, this sort of thing, in my experience, I always, like, um, kind of like the software version of Intel's TikTok approach, and that is you should refactor and make no semantic changes whatsoever, and that way you can um, basically compare your two implementations against each other, run all the same unit tests, and then once everything's cleaned up, um, that's, so that's your tick, and then your talk is you add new features, right? So after op group uh, is deployed, there's absolutely no reason why, and other things that maybe are a little awkward, there's no reason why someday we wouldn't clean that all up in a completely new transaction format. That's right. Question here. Um, so I'm just going to put this out here. Um, I, I would not be against uh, changing the transaction format just to get native tokens because I think that's that would be great. I'm, I'm curious uh, if, if there's any ways to speed up that process uh, and we can you know, schedule it in a hard fork in six months or something along those lines. Huh? Technically, op group is soft fork, so we can do it at any time once miners start, you know, signaling for it. Uh, te technically, it is a soft fork, but it's probably easier if we activate it at the same time as the hard fork, since it will break every wallet. Um, go. <laughs> okay. So, so what happens is op group is a is a different uh, script, right? And so, what what's going to happen is your wallet is going to receive this strange output, and it's not going to know what it is. So, it's just going to forget it. It's going to drop it, right? So, the effect is, if you send a colored coin to a wallet that doesn't support op group, it it won't even see it. So I think that's actually the best thing. It, it would the worst thing is if you accidentally spend that output, right, and you know remove the tokenization even, which um, is possible in some of the older colored coin approaches. So in this case, you know it seems to disappear, and you know you might have some uh, fear and angst about that, or you know an excitement, but then you upgrade your wallet or switch it to a different wallet, and suddenly you know, that wallet understands the output and it appears, right? So that would be, if you made no changes at all to your wallet, that's what happens. I don't think it's that bad. If you make a, a really small change to your wallet, you could say, you could put up a little red box that says, I just received a weird output, you know, so, and I don't understand it, so I'm gonna ignore it, and I think then even the end user wouldn't freak out. Uh, I need a, one question here. Uh, similar question on the speed of the transition and stuff. Uh, I, I used Coin Prison quite a bit in the past few years, and it's just coming, it's closing down on March 31st. Is there any way you could implement Colored Coin in like a week, just just so just to save the people who might have been using Coin Prison for whatever they were using, specifically Luca, the L Y K K project. Yeah. I, I was kind of looking at. It, I thought it was interesting. So, 
it's it's been running on testnet for so can you make it live now. in a week so yeah. just bring everybody over and yeah. be the saving grace i think we need, you would, we would all need to you know talk to the miners and and the rest of the community and put a lot of excitement and pressure on them can you do it in a week i can't personally if you guys all just you know pig pile on certain people Wait, then this maybe leads me to ask a question so for Coin Prism and all the old colored coin protocols that were on Bitcoin before the Bitcoin Cash fork, are they usable right now because they're on the Bitcoin Cash version? I mean, possibly, right? Is, is there any software that supports the fork and the Coin Prism? I don't know. I mean, they're theoretically there and everything, but you'd there. need you'd need that, yeah. Okay, so Wait, which gives another like good argument. We, which gives us another good argument why we should, it should be native because yep. there is a lot of tethers on the Bitcoin Cash blockchain, but you can't use them because there's no there's no node software that can can make you spend them. So, like all these different layer two uh, protocols, they need very specific node software to support them. Awesome. I actually, I actually agree with the point that you're making, but I find the idea of uh, running a full node to store your tethers uh, somewhat contradictory in, in, in some ways. You know, you want to trustlessly hold your trusted uh, tokens. Um, so, so actually, uh, you made a good point before. In principle, I think if someone developed it, you, you could just restart Coin Prism on Bitcoin Cash, but someone would actually have to you know, build it, which... I imagine wouldn't be too much work. You just re-implement what was built before. Um, I would also like to add, um, and, and also in principle, uh, we could hard fork in a week <laughs> to do these changes, but that's that's probably not a good idea to do things that quickly. Yeah. Well, it's, it's it's a soft fork. It's not a hard fork. So yes, the miners could activate it in a week, uh, but I think uh, wallet developers will be very sad if we do, <laughs> and a lot of people will be very sad, so we shouldn't do that. <laughs> oh, but yeah, it's, it's only really in more emergency situations that, that we would have such a short timeline. Uh, since we're on the subject, I would like to just put out there, um, I, I basically think that for all changes, we should do hard forks. Uh, I have um, more political ideas around why it should be that way, but in principle, I think it's better that <clears throat> in order to accept a change to the network, the if you're just being passive, you shouldn't just go along with it. I think, I think in terms of you know freedom and you know our choice, I think hard forks are better because then people need to consciously agree to that change. Yeah. And, and I think that's that's a much better way to go about things. So I think uh, for Bitcoin Cash, we're not scared of hard forks. We might as well do all our changes through hard forks because it supports the principles of Bitcoin Cash and the vision of Satoshi. All right. Okay, uh, thanks to the audience. We're gonna, uh, my, my last send-off, I love doing send-offs. Um, each of you, um, we got a group of people here who are excited about tokens and colored coins. Um, one, what's your prediction for colored coins on, on, on Bitcoin Cash in the next three months? Not long, just next three months. And then lastly, what can we do in the audience to participate and get involved? Um. I wouldn't want to deploy it when it's not ready, you know. Uh, but you guys can help by putting pressure on, you know, the the greater community. And I don't mean negative pressure; just add excitement, run Bitcoin Unlimited nodes, mine with Bitcoin Unlimited, and that will, you know, put the rest of the community on notice to say this is actually a really important feature. I personally think that it's uh, the most important feature right now in terms of driving adoption, and so. Um, I would encourage everyone to do that in the next few months. And, you know, there is a possibility with that kind of excitement that um, we might, you know, and, and if there's like, uh, if it turns out that's, that some company is ready to go and ready to really put tokens on, then we might be able to move the schedule up because, like I said, the software is there. I would say download either a full node uh, that connects to the Bitcoin Limited testnet, or an SPV node that connects to the testnet and start building applications that uses tokens. That's start building, start, start building the, the projects, the software that uses the tokens. Do it on testnets. Show people what you can do. Um, 
I would say uh, you, don't, you don't have to be a developer to really have a lot of influence. And I think you'd be surprised, uh, you know, if everyone in this room got onto Reddit tomorrow and crusaded for this change, we would see it within a month. I think, um, so, you know, if you really want to see a change, you know, in the protocol, speak up, you know, and, and, and put your weight on the scales to, to, to make that change happen. It's, it's not up to the developers, it's, it's, it's up to the consensus. And uh, we're all a part of that consensus. So, you know, get involved. Here, here. <laughs> Run a node, build a business, make your voice heard. It's wonderful being in a community where all of those options are open to us. So, that's great. Thank you, David. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you, Emil. And thank you, I keep forgetting your name. Justin. Justin. Thank you, audience. <laughs> that was it. Woo!